Hey guys, welcome and welcome back to my channel. My name is Mikey. You guys are rocking with me on Mikey's Intellectual Corner. On today's episode, we are diving back into our Napoleon series. This is Napoleon 1813, The Road to Leipzig. Without further ado, we're just going to get started. Let's see. Eighteen twelve had been a disastrous year for Napoleon. His invasion of Russia had led to the almost total destruction of an army of half a million men. Now Poland and Germany were wide open to Russian attack. Some advised Emperor Alexander that this was the time to make a favourable peace with Napoleon. Russia's own armies had been mauled and Western Russia devastated. But Alexander was determined to see Napoleon defeated for good, to free Europe from his clutches, and avenge Moscow's destruction by taking Paris. Yeah, I mean, plus you could probably tell that he just Napoleon would would want to be able to save face after that after a defeat like that, because obviously he's not stupid. He knows the rest of um, the Allies are going to want to are going to smell the you know the blood in the water and stuff like that. So. You know what I'm saying? He he knows he needs to finish this dude off, otherwise it's just gonna this is just gonna continue. Plus he probably wants to avenge you know, some of the, the people of Russia who had to suffer through all this and stuff, maybe I'm thinking but let's... goes destruction by taking Paris. Napoleon's allies were deserting him. Prussian troops had already agreed a truce with the Russians. Schwarzenberg's corps marched back to Austria which assumed a policy of watchful neutrality. Napoleon had left Marshal Murat in charge of the remnants of the army, but he left for the Kingdom of Naples, hoping to cut a deal with the Allies that would let him keep his throne. He was replaced by Napoleon's stepson Eugène, who'd proved himself a brave and able soldier in Russia, but was unused to independent command and now faced odds of four to one. As Russian forces advanced through Poland, he continued to retreat west, leaving Gar Damn, that's crazy. Freaking Kutuzov and them are still chasing. I would have thought that, at the very least, Kutuzov would have his troops, you know, go back, because they've been going pretty much since uh, Moscow. I know they're tired, so let's see. Harrison's to hold strategic fortresses most of which were soon besieged. On the 7th of February, Russian troops entered Warsaw unopposed. Napoleon's Polish client state, the Duchy of Warsaw, effectively ceased to exist. Three weeks later, Russian troops entered Berlin, while Sweden joined the Allies. Sweden was ruled by Napoleon's former Marshal Bernadotte, now officially known as Crown Prince Karl Johan. Many would accuse him of betraying Napoleon, but he'd always been clear that once he became Sweden's Crown Prince, he'd pursue Swedish interests, which is what he now claimed to do. Yeah, I mean, technically, uh, Napoleon occupying Swedish Pomerania kind of went against exactly that Swedish um, interest, so he kind of had no choice but to go against Napoleon at that point, if that was the way that he, you know, wanted to rule. He now claimed to do. In exchange for Norway, to be taken from France's ally, Denmark, and one million pounds from Britain, Bernadotte agreed to join what was now the sixth coalition against France since the revolution with an army of 30,000 troops. Ten days later, King Frederick William of Prussia declared war on France. It followed weeks of indecision. The king was widely seen as a weak character and terrified of Napoleon. But with guarantees of Russian military support, the return of lost territory, and enormous financial and material aid from Britain, he agreed to field an army of 80,000 men. On the 17th of March, he issued a proclamation to the people of Prussia and Germany. And mein Volk, to my people, 
summoning them to fight for Prussia and Germany's honour, in what would soon be known as the German War of Liberation. The Prussian army had been greatly reformed since its humiliating defeat to Napoleon in 1806. A military commission headed by General von Scharnhorst had sacked nearly 200 old generals and abolished flogging, expanded recruitment and introduced exams for officers, and overhauled training, tactics and drill. Almost kind of surprising that officers didn't have to go through more scrutiny and stuff like that. Because I know in like today's uh, military, at least for us in the United States, you have to go through a few different training and, and um, scrutiny, different things and tests and all that stuff to become just an NCO, let alone a, a officer. Officers have to go through a whole different school and all that stuff. So it's, it's very rigorous, but definitely a... Uh, Good to see that they are reforming stuff to the Prussian army that we know. When Napoleon met the new Prussian army in battle two months later, he remarked, these animals have learned something. Small consolation, they'd learned most of it from him. Yeah, but in all reality though, they also, if we're saying, um, I'm pretty sure Austri Austrians learn what they knew from him also. And that was like way back in like the fourth video I think and then also if we're being technical uh, Sweden technically learn what they are doing now from him too because you know Bernda obviously learned from what he knows from him also but all right let's keep it moving As his enemies massed in Germany, Napoleon was in Paris, working tirelessly to build a new army with which to face them. 137,000 new conscripts joined the army, and laws passed to call up 100,000 more, while 40,000 veterans from the army in Spain, 16,000 marines, and 80,000 men of the National Guard a home defence force, were transferred to Germany. The new conscripts were nicknamed Marie-Louises, after Napoleon's young wife, who passed the new conscription laws in his absence. They were young and raw, two-thirds were teenagers, and there was a severe lack of experienced officers and NCOs, in short, the countless irreplaceable veterans now lying beneath Russian soil. There was also a critical shortage of cavalry, a crisis mocked by British satirists. It would take Napoleon longer to replace the many thousands of horses and trained horsemen who'd perished in Russia. When Napoleon left Paris for Germany in mid-April, the French situation was precarious. Eugène had been forced back behind the river Elbe to the fortified city of Magdeburg, Dresden, the capital of Saxony, had fallen to the Prussians. The Duchy of Mecklenburg-Schwerin became the first German state to defect from Napoleon's Confederation of the Rhine. Russian Cossacks raided as far as Hamburg, inspiring local revolts against French occupying forces. And if we're being honest, uh, that Cossack you know, unit over there could probably just route, probably route their entire army with just that unit. Um, just... Local revolts against French occupying forces. Meanwhile, Austria stood on the sidelines, so far declining to back either side. Napoleon's miraculous feat of organisation meant he now had more than 200,000 troops in Germany. And the Emperor's personal magnetism was undimmed. The morale of his army was high. The Russians, on the other hand, lost their iconic commander, Field Marshal Kutuzov, to pneumonia on the 28th of April. His role was taken over by General Wittgenstein. 
Russian troops were exhausted and far from home, their army weakened by the need to contain French garrisons across Poland and Germany. Prussia and Sweden had yet to fully mobilise their strength, and Allied forces barely mustered 100,000 men. They were now heavily outnumbered. Yeah, but again, though, he, they're outnumbered by the day. They have more, they have way more trained men. So that's, you know what I'm saying, that who can stay in formations and stuff like that, who's not going to route easy in the face of danger, stuff like that. And the fact that they have, you know, that whole unit of Cossacks, which, in my opinion, are very underrated and probably going to do some damage. So let's see. They were now heavily outnumbered by Napoleon, and the French Emperor decided to strike quickly. He ordered Marshal Davout to Hamburg, with 35,000 men, to secure his northern flank. He would march against the Russian and Prussian forces converging on Leipzig to force a decisive battle. Victory would make Austria think twice about joining the Allies allow him to rescue the 90,000 men trapped in garrisons across Germany and Poland, and re-establish his dominance over Europe. As Napoleon advanced on Leipzig, the Allies faced a predicament. To risk battle against Napoleon's larger army, or give up Germany without a fight, a potentially devastating blow to Allied morale and any chance of winning Austria over to their cause. Allied headquarters made the bold decision to attack. They knew most of Napoleon's army was made up of raw conscripts, that their own troops were better trained and had a great superiority in cavalry and artillery. The Allies agreed that as Napoleon crossed the Sala River, they would hit his right flank before he could concentrate the full mass of his forces. The two armies were on a collision course, but Napoleon's shortage of cavalry meant he lacked information about Allied movements. On the 1st of May, Marshal Bessières, commanding the cavalry in Murat's absence, was carrying out reconnaissance himself when he was hit by a cannonball and killed instantly. Bessières was the second of Napoleon's marshals to be killed in action, and like Lannes, an old comrade and trusted friend. The Allies were able to surprise Napoleon falling on Marshal Ney's 3rd Corps near Lutzen. Ney's troops had to cling on in the face of a Russian and Prussian onslaught, while Napoleon rapidly redirected his other corps to fall on the enemy's flanks. At one stage, Napoleon had to personally help rally routing troops as they broke in the face of determined Prussian assaults. But on the whole, his young conscripts fought with courage. And despite hours of savage fighting, Wittgenstein could not exploit his early advantage. As yeah, at least these new recruits are getting their, um, their stripes in and stuff like that and getting some, some experience in, because, you know what I'm saying, that's the, really the, the main thing that's going to get them, other than training and stuff like that. But if you don't have training, the, the only other thing that's really going to get you to it is just new experience. Yeah. Exploit his early advantage. As French reinforcements arrived, the battle turned against him. Towards dusk, the Allies were forced to break off the engagement. Though they'd inflicted around 22,000 casualties, losing just half as many men. General von Scharnhorst mortally wounded, was among them. Crucially, Napoleon's lack of cavalry meant he was unable to pursue the enemy, who retreated in good order. Expecting the Prussians to fall back on Berlin, Napoleon sent Marshal Ney in pursuit, while he continued east. But the Allied army stayed together, withdrawing to a defensive position at Bautzen, 
deliberately close to the Austrian border, hoping to entice Schwarzenberg to intervene, and daring Napoleon to violate Austrian neutrality. Neither happened. Instead, Napoleon ordered Ney to swing south, to fall on the Allies' northern flank, while he launched a frontal assault to pin them in place. The battle lasted two days, as French infantry struggled forward against the Prussian and Russian lines. But a misunderstanding over Ney's orders caused a delay that allowed the Allies to narrowly escape Napoleon's trap. Once more, the Allies fought with great determination and inflicted many more losses than they suffered. There were more casualties during the pursuit, including the next day General Duroc, Grand Marshal of the Palace, responsible for Napoleon's personal arrangements, and his closest surviving friend. Riding with Napoleon's staff, a freak cannon shot ricocheted off a tree and disemboweled him. His slow, painful death deeply upset Napoleon. The Emperor continued his pursuit to Breslau, once again hindered by his lack of experienced cavalry, while Oudinot was sent north to take Berlin, but was held at Luckau by von Bülow's Prussian corps. On the 2nd of June, with both sides strained to breaking point, neutral Austria proposed a ceasefire, which, to the surprise of many, Napoleon accepted. Well, yeah, it's pretty surprising, but at the same time, I'm pretty sure it was probably done because, you know, Napoleon just wanted to keep his... One, wanted to keep his empire. Two, just obviously just lost, like, two of his best friends um, and best, you know, some of his best military personnel. And three, the fact that he... This, will, this ceasefire will give him more time to be able to not only recruit more um, more of an, a bigger army, but actually train that army, you know what I'm saying, so that they're at least decent and not getting, um, you know what I'm saying, kind of routed and... It almost kind of seems like they're just winning off numbers, really, but we'll see. Napoleon accepted. The armistice of Plaswitz would last more than two months, a period of intense diplomacy and military mobilization by both sides. Napoleon wanted time to rebuild his cavalry, a shortage of which had allowed the Allies to escape twice. But he also wanted to keep Austria on side, which he feared might join the Allies with 200,000 troops, even though Emperor Francis I was now his father-in-law, since Napoleon's marriage to his daughter, Marie-Louise, in 1810. Austrian Foreign Minister Clemens von Metternich, who'd become one of 19th century Europe's most influential statesmen, now took center stage. Metternich wanted peace and to see Austria restored as a great European power, which meant Napoleon contained, but not crushed, which would hand too much power to Russia. In June, he travelled to Dresden to ask Napoleon to make concessions, while promising the Allies that if he did not, Austria would join them. But Napoleon dismissed Metternich's terms out of hand. He would not return the Illyrian provinces to Austria, agree to the repartition of Poland, or the breakup of the Confederation of the Rhine. All were out of the question. Napoleon famously threw his hat to the ground in fury. Of course, I mean, if you think about it, that means that technically he, they, they're asking him to undo everything he's worked so hard to accomplish on top of all the freaking the Frenchmen and, and Germans who have given their lives for this, uh, for the, all that to be even be. And the fact that it would also, uh, in my opinion, probably make everybody look at him like he's still weak, even though they're still being able to keep their borders because their borders are freaking gargantuan right now. But still, you know what I'm saying? And 
if anything, that still makes him more weaker, and who knows. Napoleon famously threw his hat to the ground in fury. Peace and war lie in your majesty's hands, Metternich is said to have warned him. Today you can still make peace. Tomorrow it may be too late. But Napoleon preferred war to what he called a humiliating peace. On the 12th of August 1813, Austria joined the Sixth Coalition and declared war on France. The Allies now had a numerical advantage of 3 to 2, and a new strategy, the Trachenberg Plan. Recognising Napoleon's genius, the Allies would avoid battle with the Emperor and instead target his marshals, threaten his flanks and wear down French forces until it was time to close in for the kill. Over the next few months, the coalition would also receive massive material support from Britain, including £8 million in silver and gold coin, 200 cannon with transport, 120,000 firearms, 18 million rounds of ammunition, 23,000 barrels of gunpowder, 30,000 swords and sabres, 150,000 uniforms, 175,000 pairs of boots, 1.5 million pounds of beef, biscuit and flour, and 28,000 gallons of rum and brandy. The total value of British aid to the coalition in 1813 was 11.3 million pounds. Today, worth around half a billion dollars. No, and obviously I don't know uh, Britain, like I don't know in depth what Britain's finances were in this time period or whatever, but obviously they had a colonial power going on, but in my opinion, it kind of seems like they hate Napoleon so much that they are willing to go bankrupt um, in, in order to see his downfall, because that's a crazy amount, especially in these times, you know what I'm saying, where I'm sure... Uh, a lot of people were stealing boots and, and uniforms off other uh, dead bodies and stuff just to make sure that they had what they needed and stuff, you know what I'm saying? Pounds. Today, worth around half a billion dollars. Napoleon, meanwhile, had turned Dresden into a major supply depot and strengthened his cavalry arm, though it remained a pale shadow of its glorious past. Murat returned to lead it his secret approach to the Allies having been rebuffed. But when news arrived of King Joseph's disastrous defeat to Wellington's Anglo-Spanish-Portuguese army at the Battle of Vitoria, Napoleon had to send Marshal Soult, one of his best commanders, to salvage the situation. On the 15th of August, Napoleon left Dresden and advanced against what he considered the most urgent threat, the joint Prussian-Russian army of Silesia, commanded by General Gebhard von Blücher, soon to win the nickname Marshal Vorwärts, Marshal Forwards, for his aggressive leadership. But Blücher followed the new plan and retreated when he learned of Napoleon's advance. Napoleon then received news from Marshal Saint-Serre, holding Dresden with 20,000 men, that Schwarzenberg's gigantic army of Bohemia was approaching, and the city and its supplies were in danger. Napoleon left Marshal Macdonald to keep an eye on Blücher, and raced back to Dresden, sending Van Damme's first corps to threaten Schwarzenberg's communications. I was about to say, that might be their only option, is just to have um, Napoleon on kind of like a horse with like maybe a hundred men around him, like on horseback to, you know, make sure nobody captures him around this crazy battlefield right now, and just have him race around the battlefield uh, so that way, you know, he can help out his marshals and stuff like that, because other than that, um, you know what I'm saying, 
I don't really see how he can... ...communications. By the time the Allied assault began, enough reinforcements had arrived to fight off the attack. The next day, despite being heavily outnumbered, Napoleon ordered a counterattack. Struggling through mud and heavy rain, Marshal Murat's advance, supported by Victor's 2nd Corps, broke the Allied left flank and took 13,000 prisoners. The Allies had suffered a disastrous defeat because they'd ignored their own rule. Don't take on Napoleon in battle. But news soon arrived that turned the situation on its head. Marshal Oudinot had resumed his advance on Berlin with 66,000 men. But in three days of heavy combat around Grossbiren, he was defeated by Bernadotte's Army of the North. Some of the most savage fighting was between Napoleon's Saxon allies and von Bülow's Prussians, two German states that for now remained on opposing sides. Three days later, at the Katzbach River, Blücher inflicted a crushing defeat on Marshal Macdonald, driving some French troops into the river itself. Macdonald lost 30,000 men, three eagles and a hundred guns, for Blücher's 22,000 casualties. Three days after Napoleon's victory at Dresden, as Van Damme's corps pursued the Allies, it became trapped in wooded valleys around Kulm and was overrun. General Van Damme himself was dragged from his horse by Cossacks, as he and 10,000 of his men were made prisoner. Napoleon sent Ney to take over from Udino, who engaged Bülow's Prussian corps at Denewitz. The Prussians fighting to save Berlin held their own, until Russian and Swedish reinforcements arrived to turn the battle decisively in the Allies' favour. Ney's retreat became a rout, with the loss of another 22,000 men. Napoleon's brilliant victory at Dresden had been completely overturned in just 10 days. The Allied plan was working. Napoleon became increasingly frustrated as Allied armies withdrew wherever he advanced, and advanced wherever he was not. Yeah, on top of that, you gotta think craziness going on. He has, we gotta think he has teenagers in his army, and at the end of the day, probably teenagers are gonna do what teenagers, you know, do best, and they're probably gonna start thinking this is all bullcrap, why are we here? And they're gonna start um, leaving the army and stuff like that en masse. On top of the fact that um, to, for him, his program start feeling like babysitting. On top of the fact that everybody's losing around him, so he's really starting to get you know frustrated. I feel like withdrew wherever he advanced, and advanced wherever he was not. His teenage conscripts were exhausted by constant marching, and famished as Saxony had been stripped bare of supplies. Thousands fell sick. Thousands more deserted. Russian and Prussian light troops were now operating behind Napoleon's army, harassing his communications with France. Many of Napoleon's marshals advised him to pull back to the River Rhine. But Napoleon wasn't giving up Germany without a fight. By October 1813, Napoleon faced a third of a million Allied troops in Germany, converging on him from three directions. 900 miles away, Field Marshal Wellington was crossing the Bidassoa River into France, the first enemy army on French soil in nearly 20 years. While the Kingdom of Bavaria, a French ally since the days of Austerlitz, had secretly agreed to switch sides, and would declare war on France on the 14th of October. 
Napoleon planned to defend the line of the River Elbe. But the arrival of General Bennigsen's reserve Russian army freed up Blücher, who suddenly marched to join forces with Bernadotte, and forced his way across the Elbe at Wartenberg. Napoleon went north with 150,000 men, seeking the decisive battle that would change his fortunes. But once more, Blücher narrowly escaped him. Then came news from Murat, who'd been left with 67,000 men to cover Schwarzenberg. The enemy had bypassed Dresden, and was heading for Leipzig. If the city fell, Napoleon would be cut off from France. Once more, he was advised to fall back to the Rhine. But instead, Napoleon ordered all his forces to concentrate at Leipzig. He would risk everything in one great battle to decide the fate of his empire and the fate of Europe. All right, guys, uh, I'm pretty sure the next one's going to be a long, long one. But uh, without further ado, guys, thank you again for joining me on another episode of our Napoleonic War series. These are getting pretty good. Um, without further ado, guys, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you again for joining me on another episode. I'll see you guys when I see you. I'm out. Peace.